Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Art Gallery. It is my pleasure to start this afternoon. We are excited and honored to have three presenters, three visiting artists, and I will do um, the introduction. Uh, Katya Colcio will, will speak about her current project, Vitality Project Donbass, in collaboration with Ukrainian NGOs, Development Foundation Community Self-Help, uh, which was funded by the United Nations Recovery and Peace Building Program. Katya also teaches at Wesleyan uh, University, and uh, it's just so exciting that she's here. Uh, Larissa Babic uh, lives in Kyiv, uh, where she works with Ukrainian contemporary artists. She's a curator, writer, and co-conspirator of experimental project, projects. Um, she, in, in April 2014, Larissa brought Gregory Chalette and Olga Kapionkina. These are my friends. <laughs> Um, uh, imaginary their imaginary archive to Ukraine um, and included new works by local artists. Her writing has been published in Art Margins, online, um, Brooklyn Rail, and other publications. She is a member of the Art Workers Self Defense Initiative. And Nadia Tarnavsky. Um, is a Ukrainian-born folk uh, music performer. She wrote recently about herself. Music has always been a part of my family's life. My parents both sing and adore Ukrainian folk music. And now fortunate, and how fortunate for me that they had a large collection of, of vinyl records of Ukrainian folk music. So it's such an exciting collaboration, and this is a part of our current exhibition, Women at War, um, 14 Ukrainian uh, artists that we are presenting until October 15th. So let's, uh, let us welcome our uh, visiting artists. First of all, welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Katya Kultio. I, as uh, Yulia said, I teach at Wesleyan University down the street in the dance department. When Russia first invaded Ukraine in 2014, um, starting with, with, the, with Crimea, I began working and teaching somatic workshops in Ukraine. I worked with Ukrainian colleagues to develop a, resilience, a program in resiliency that has been funded by the United Nations and is being published in a book form in Ukraine this November. Hello. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's big. I'm Larissa Babi, and I'm a translator and a writer and a dancer who's been living in Ukraine for 17 years. And I've been writing about my experiences of the past half year on Substack. Let's turn this this way. And my name is Nadia Tarnowski. I am a professional singer, uh, actor, playwright, and collector of traditional Ukrainian folk songs and customs. And I get to keep going. See, this is what happens when I don't look at the paper. Hang on. This isn't for them. So um, we played some photographs and some music earlier. Those are photographs that I took in cities and villages around Ukraine during my Fulbright, which happened between 2017 and 2018. And in every place that I traveled, and one of the reasons we wanted to show those photographs, I was met with generosity and abundance of spirit. Doors were opened to me, songs were shared with me, traditions were shared with me, embraces were bestowed upon me from a deep well of compassion and kindness. And these were families and households who had endured so much pain in the past, surviving Stalin's genocidal famine in 1933, World War II, purges of civic leaders, poets, artists, culture makers, journalists. And yet my tentative knock on the door was always replied to with open hearts, laughter, goodness. 
And during the winter of 2013 and 2014, more than a million Ukrainian citizens across ethnic, religious, and economic lines united in a nonviolent campaign demanding political reforms and denouncing dictator Viktor Yanukovych, who was then president, for his pro-Russian increasingly authoritarian policies. Despite violent government attacks, their resistance eventually led Yanukovych to flee the country and propelled decentralization and social reform in Ukraine. And in direct response to the pro-democracy movement, Russian President Vladimir Putin invaded the Crimea Peninsula. He also sent Russian troops, mercenaries, and extremist groups into Ukraine's southeastern region called the Donbas. That initial conflict claimed over 14,000 lives and forced 1.3 million people from their homes. Most of them were internally displaced refugees. Shortly after that revolution, I began working in Ukraine. I worked with activists, war relief workers, and also those defending the border, soldiers, volunteer defenders. We practiced mindful and creative movement, breathing, moving, sharing, sensing, connecting, reorienting ourselves to these new circumstances. When the world changes around us, we explore those new environments to reorient ourselves, much like children do in their new world. Over the past two years, the world has changed around us, here. We've changed how and where we move, how close we stand to one another, six feet now, sometimes closer, We've even changed how we breathe. But we've explored and we found ways to connect anyway. We found ways to connect to one another and work together under those new circumstances, leaning on our existing strengths. We found ways and we'll continue to find more ways, even when it means wearing masks to protect ourselves and others. Orienting ourselves in the world, connecting to one another, is as much a physical process as it is a cognitive one. In the early morning hours on February 24th, 2022, Putin expanded his invasion, begun in 2014, with a full-scale war on Ukraine. The Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, the OHCHR, has verified, and I stress that word, that these are just verified, a total of 5,587 civilian deaths during Russia's invasion of Ukraine as of August 21st of this year. Of them, 362 were children. Furthermore, 7,890 people have reported being injured. However, the OHCHR specified that real numbers could be much higher, and at least 12 million people, and that is about 25% or a quarter of the population of Ukraine, are refugees and have fled their homes. And in fact, those numbers could be as much as eight times higher. On September 2nd, the Ukrainian Ministry of Internal Affairs reported that over 7,000 civilians have been killed, but that doesn't include the 22,000 people who perished in Mariupol, according to its mayor, still before the city in southern Ukraine was occupied completely by the Russians. Plus, while the Ukrainian government is reluctant to reveal how many casualties its troops have experienced, they stated already in the summertime that at least 10,000 had died. And you can see this backpack. This is the backpack with which I left Kiev on February 24th. And for the next month and a half after that, I carried this bag. Um, I left my apartment wearing this with this and the clothing that I was wearing, my cat and its carrier. And I didn't leave this out of my sight for the next month and a half. So where do you find a suitcase in which you can fit all of your life? What would your heart pack into your emergency suitcase? And what must it bring 
not only to just survive, but to heal and flourish. Lidis and Katya and I are not Ukrainian citizens. We're all born in the U.S. from parents who packed their lives into a suitcase, a burlap bag, a wagon drawn by horses, and physically left their homeland behind, but mentally, spiritually, internally brought their country with them. Our names reveal this love of country. We're not Loretta, Kathy, or Nadine. We're Larissa, Katya, Nadia. And our parents brought with them a love of the Ukrainian homeland, its language, its customs, and their desire for a sovereign Ukraine. And so even though I am a citizen of the United States, my heart says a phrase heard so often in Ukraine and its diaspora communities, Ukraina, which means everything will be Ukraine. And where Ukrainians live, whether it's within the geographical borders of an Eastern European nation called Ukraine, or on the prairies of Canada, or the outback of Australia, the factory towns in the Northeast United States, they bring Ukraine with them, like so many other immigrants who make a foreign country their home, and bring within their suitcase a life which they once lived somewhere else, but somewhere that is dear to their hearts. Breathing is both a physical and an emotional act. Notice where you are right now. Notice your body in this space. Bring your attention to the movement in your body when you breathe. Try again. And notice that in order to fully exhale, you have to feel safe enough to let go. Try that. Body. Imagine how high your lungs go. In your torso. Okay, using your fingers, nice. Using your fingers, touch these bones that stick out if you're not carrying 10 different things. Yeah. Your clavicle. Poke behind. You see how it's soft? And if you move your shoulders, you can kind of poke behind it. That's how high your lungs go. Right? Put your hands on your belly and take a deep breath. That's not air. There doesn't go down there. That's your diaphragm pushing down on your, on your organs, kind of ma massaging you from the inside. Our breathing is healing. I hate to do this, but imagine a s stressful situation, somewhere where you're a little nervous, and then try taking a deep breath. Just something that, just notice if anything changes or how. And then go back to imagining your favorite place or your bedroom or the fact that you have no responsibilities for the next 20 minutes or half hour. Take a deep breath in and just sigh. <sighs> Can you feel that? Right? The breath is healing. Try that again. Inhale and make a sigh so that you can kind of feel it. It can be quiet. <sighs> nice. Okay, let's try one more time. Let's all breathe in for three counts. I'll count them. And then on the exhale, hum. You have my lips open or closed. One, two, three. Hmm. Feel that? And maybe you can't. So it's a question. It's interesting. Sometimes you can feel that vibration. Maybe it means change your lips a little bit or make the sigh a little lower or higher or a little louder. Let's try it one more time. On the count of three, we inhale for three counts and then on the exhale, play around with your hmm. 
and this time see if you can feel the vibration not just of your own hum but the vibration floating through the space ready one inhaling one two three could you feel that in you we even connect through our breathing we're here together I'd like to share something that I wrote on April 21st. A week ago, I filled an old hiking backpack with an assortment of things I might need in the next several months and said goodbye to my apartment with full uncertainty about when I will next return for the second time. But this time, never did not cross my mind. Tonight in Lviv, the air is chilly, but with the texture of spring. I have to make a certain effort to keep sensing the war when it's happening somewhere further away. Still, my legs tingle as I think of the thousand or so people in Mariupol who remain underground in the tunnels of the Azovstal plant, which Putin has ordered to seal off as if to exterminate them. Yesterday, while writing a letter to people outside Ukraine about what is going on in Mariupol, I nearly wrote the word unimaginable and then stop. This has happened. It is now outside the realm of imagination. It is real. It's history, if you will. I have spoken to women who escaped from Mariupol, taking in and communicating with them not only through words but attention, our bodies in proximity. I knew in the moment, and know still, that I cannot imagine what each of them went through. Imagination, its landscape and its limits is always an individual matter. There is a difference between I cannot imagine and unimaginable. Russia's unjustified invasion and ongoing brutal assault of Ukraine with its barbaric genocidal attack on civilians and soldiers outside existing international conventions of war has drastically moved the threshold for what can be called unimaginable. I heard a story from the person who listened to the person who experienced it. In Bucha, the Russian soldiers, young and scared, burst into a bomb shelter filled with women and children. They had them stand up and then shot every other one. Genocide is about destroying the group, so its victims are arbitrary. When you are standing next to someone who is being shot, the difference between you and someone else is negligible. I'm a grandchild of World War II. My mother is a Holodomor researcher. I've read Primo Levi. The cruelty that human beings can inflict on one another does not surprise me. The horror of what we have learned about what the Russians did to civilians in Bucha and throughout the Kyiv region took time to sink in, to pass through generations formed layers of resistance from refusing to look, sleeping on it, and then disbelief. Not that it happened, but that I am here, looking at these photos, that this is happening here, where I am. There are two ways to lose touch with the war. One is feeling safe and comfortable and unperturbed, secure in what you know, while the other is entertaining threats and potential dangers, including that of nuclear attack, so that your senses become clouded and garbled by fear. You need to do something to make the events of war more concrete, whether going to the place where it happened, talking to a person who lived through it, formulating a question and looking for the answer, or just taking a walk or a shower and remembering where you are and what you are doing. I've made a practice of repeating, I have never stood next to someone who is being shot. Not, 
how lucky I am to not be the person who was shot, or how fortunate and privileged I am to never have had the experience of standing next to someone that is being shot. Just the facts made proximal through sentence construction. I have never stood next to someone that is being shot. Such experiences form people for generations. My grandparents saw their friends murdered lying by the side of the road as they fled Ukraine in 1943. They had planned to escape together in the middle of the night, but my grandfather had an intuition that it was better to wait until morning while the friends left according to plan. How do you live with that? What about the boy who witnessed his mother being raped for several hours and then she died? His hair went gray overnight. Someone is already thinking about how he will recover. And I am still stuck on, how can I live with this? I first felt shame on February 24th as I was running away from Kyiv in fear of the Russian advance. I felt ashamed before my sister, who was absolutely right when she urged me to leave the Sunday before, and before my grandmother, who turned 95 that day, for all she had done to plant me in America before the promise of a good life, here I was participating in history's repeat performance. The shame of being a refugee, of lacking the courage to stay and fight, of failing to defend one's home and people, is the shame of leaving what's yours for the sake of self-preservation. It's recognizing in yourself the compulsion toward moving constantly, whether away from the site of danger or wound up in unceasing activity, so as to keep from feeling the pain and horror and responsibility of witnessing and living with crimes that we are now learning to imagine. Call in the
On March 16th, I received the following message from my dear friend Vera, who is an actress, singer, writer, and translator currently living in Lviv. She writes, I take great care of your postcards. Honestly, I took them off the walls because if anything, I wouldn't want them to disappear. We had sirens this morning, but they seemed appropriate in some way, encouraging right now. Please don't cry too much. We will endure. Although I don't know for how long, and at such a high price. But I want to talk about light while there is so much anxiety in the air. I have a really tough time spending those night hours in the basement, just like everyone does. You can't sleep and you can't do much because there's only concrete, dust, and wooden pallets to sit on. And it's night. You can't sing. In the afternoon, I went out and bought a piece of linen. Today, I cut it to the right size and washed it. I think it will be an embroidered towel, a large towel, like the ones they sew in the Poltava region. I don't know how I came up with that and why, and it is absolutely absurd to make this during the war. But it's as if something pulls me. It's like singing with your hands. I am sitting now and sewing along the edge. I hug you tightly. We are standing firm. Somatic resilience, that resilience that starts in our bodies, our breathing, <clears throat> our nervous system, our habituated response mechanisms, are assimilated and embedded in our cultural practices. Our parenting techniques and soothing methods, our lullabies, our folk songs, family traditions, recipes, social customs, and spiritual practices. These are passed on from generation to generation. We thereby cultivate the power to act and to shape our world. What family, community, or personal traditions sustain you? What are the things you carry in your body? These are a few lines from a poem written by Svetlana Diduch Romanenko. I live in a country where Christmas wheat berries are prepared alongside an emergency suitcase. And deliver us from evil, whispers a mother, having a specific first and last name in mind. Pinching pierogies with her salty worry. And it's bewildering that life is still moving forward in this strange country where it is not exactly clear how to live. What do you continue to do to create, to make, to explore in such times, even if it seems absurd? Svetlana continues, the family sits down to dinner and swiftly from the sky, generously sown with stars and wheat, a song soars about love that lives in every Ukrainian emergency suitcase between the ribs and a little to the left. We have two lungs and each lung is made up of lobes. The right lung has three lobes. The left lung, anyone? <laughs> two lungs. Why only two lungs? We're not symmetrical. Nestled to the left side between our lungs is our heart. Only two lobes leaves room for the heart. Something needs to be missing to make room for the heart. 
With each breath, you massage your heart. Can you feel your heart? I, I totally can't. But I can bring my attention to it because I know it's there. Play around with it. Just try that. Can you feel your heart? Some people can feel their heart. I just can't. Someday I will. Listen to your heart. What does your heart need? Today, I want to share a song with you. I actually want you to sing it with me. So, I'm just warning you because sometimes people need extra time to steal themselves for that. Oh, we have to sing together. Oh, God. So steal yourselves now and I'll tell you a little story. And maybe her story will help give you extra steely spine. So this is Nadia Mekhiti Faroz Dabara. She's one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. She lives in the village of Kichkyuka in the Pultava region of Ukraine. And she is an icon of resilience. Born in 1936, she was orphaned during the Second World War. She married her husband, who was from Kishkivka. She wasn't originally from that village. She earned a degree in education and became a school principal. And although she lived in Ukraine, she was a teacher of Russian language and literature. And she is the last surviving member of the original Drevo Ensemble from Kishkivka which is a group of friends who sang together since the 1960s. I'll put their picture up so that you can also get extra resolve. <laughs> she is the last surviving, she's the only person alive, she's there on the left in this photo. The rest of these people have passed on. May their memory be eternal. So, do I need any more of this? No. So this song is a winter carol. And uh, the thing about winter carols is that they're sung at everybody's house, whether somebody lives in that house or doesn't live in that house, because maybe somebody will live in that house during the year, and it's important that all this abundance gets sung into the village. And Christmas carols, I, well, a lot of songs in Ukraine are very important. And... It truly is about creating abundance. Most carols, some of them talk about the baby Jesus. More often the winter carols talk about birds being in your home, having healthy livestock, beautiful children, an abundant home. This is the kinds of things that we want. And you're only responsible for three words. I made this very easy for you. So, say Sviati Vachur. Dobri Vachur. And that's going to be your mantra for the rest of this song. That's all you have to worry about. So, someone, i.e., me, will sing a little opening line, which sounds something like this. Що в Києві гради, той на бережечку. And that's going to be your note. And you're going to go, Sviati Vechor, Dobri Vechor. Beautiful. The words are there, the notes are there. The thing you're missing is your interconnectedness. This is the thing I miss the most during pandemic, singing with people. And you get to sing with people, people you've never met, and the singing will unify you. So really, listen to the people around you. And what we're singing, oh, for those of you who don't speak Ukrainian, you're singing, holy night, good night. That's all you're singing. Holy night, good night. So sing it again with me. Just the words. We're going to sing it over and over. Sviati vechor, dobri vechor. Again. Sviati vechor. 
Dom Rivet Sword, keep going. Sviati Vet Sword. Do keep doing that. I'm gonna sing something different. Sviati Vet Sword. Do Rivet Sword. If you think you've got that one, sing that one. Sviati Vet Sword. Do. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Then there's a middle one. Sviati vechon. Sing that one. Sviati vechon. Dobri vechon. Beautiful. So we're going to sing the low one. We'll sing the middle one. We'll sing the high one. If you think you just want to stay on the low one, great. Stay on the low one. Be like, I can handle two notes and three words. That's all I can do, Nadia. Great. All right, so we'll start at the bottom. Sviati vechor, dobri vechor, middle. Sviati vechor, Beautiful. Now we'll do it with Christmas carols are what I call designated driver songs because you have one person who's responsible for the verses and all the words that change and then everybody else who's had a little bit too much to drink gets to sing Sviati Vechor Dobri Vechor and they can be responsible for that and that's it. So I will sing the words that change. You come in and sing Sviati Vechor. And then I'm going to do something. I'm going to have you keep singing this but just follow. So of course it has like 20 verses. We're only going to do four. In the four that we're doing we say that in the city of Kiev on the banks of the river There, the Blessed Mother is washing vestments. And she does mean, the song does mean vestments like the clothes that a priest would wear at a liturgy. And then she's washing them and washing them, and then she sets them to dry onto a pine tree. She hangs them up on a pine tree. That's the second verse. In the third verse, angels come flying down, and they gather up these vestments. I'm trying to remember if there's another one. We'll only do three, because God loves the Trinity. <laughs> uh, so they gather up and they take the vestments. Later on in the song, they give vestments to the priest, and the priests serve liturgy. It's interesting, they serve liturgy, one liturgy for the father of the family, one liturgy for the son, one liturgy for the children. This is very common in Christmas carols, and in some villages, they will sing a verse for everyone who lives in the house. So you have the master of the house, the mistress of the house, son number one, daughter number one, son number two, daughter number two, son number three. Sometimes they'll sing for the animals, the dog, the cat, the livestock. Um, they love doing this in the Carpathians. Those carols can last for 20 minutes. They're extraordinary. But it's true, you're singing this abundance. So as you're singing this, think about what you're singing for. So you don't have to worry about, oh, am I getting the notes right? Am I singing right? Does the person next to me hear me? That's not what you're singing for. You're singing abundance into the world. You're singing peace into the world, if that's what you want. You're singing health into the world, if that's what you need. You're singing a united family, if that's what you need. I don't know what you need in your life. You do. Sing it into existence. Okay. I'm just going to check. I think we're fine. Shuv Kiev. What? Yeah, yeah. You can sing whichever one you want. And I'll review them. So I'm going to sing. And that's your starting note for. If you want to sing the middle, it's a couple notes higher. You can also do, 
You're like, oh, I don't know where that middle note is, so I'm going to wait. That's totally allowed. You could do that. You're like, oh, I'll switch in the middle. That's okay. Same thing for the top. The top is five notes higher. Sviati vechor, dobri vechor. The most important thing is to sing, regardless of what part you do. So here we go. Shtov kievi hradi, tajna berežečko. Sviati vechor, dobri vechor. Tam diva Maria, taj rezoň ke prala. Sviati večor, dobri večor. I lied, there's four verses. Vona prala prala, na ja leciu klala. Sviati večor, dobri večor. Приletіли янголята, дай резоньки забирали. Святи вечор, добрий вечор. And here's where you get to sing whatever you want to sing for. So really think about it. I'm singing for peace, I'm singing for health, I'm singing for abundance, I'm singing for united family, I'm singing for fill in the blank. Reach out to the people around you, and their energy gets to sing for that too, even though they don't know it. They are. That's what they're singing for. Sviati vechor, sviati vechor, sviati vechor, and sviati vechor, Thank you. You guys are amazing. Beautiful. Part of a project we were asked to do something creative every week and I decided to do like little vignettes with photos of women that I had learned songs from in Ukraine. That class started at the end of January of this year and went through the middle of April and because it was being taught by a woman on the west coast we finished class at like 11 p.m. at night on a Wednesday and so we finished class on Wednesday night the 24th of September at 11 o'clock at night And I started getting emails. They're bombing in Ukraine. They're bombing in Ukraine. Putin's invaded. And I was like, what? And I sat up watching CNN for like a couple hours, scream shouting at the TV. And then my project changed. It changed from talking about these women to what I call postcards from another world. And Katya saw it and said, we can't do this without showing even a bit of it. So this is just an excerpt of it. And I'm going to try and make sure that the volume is loud enough. We met in the village of musical magic. You shocked me with your proficient knowledge of English, your vegetarianism, and your deep interest in Eastern philosophy. You agreed to travel the Ukrainian countryside with me, and after visiting one grandmother, you got the bug and said, We're not spending enough of our time doing this. We need to do this all the time. When my nephew visited me in Ukraine, You graciously walked with us through the World War II Museum, translating all of the Russian placards for him. When we finished that excursion, my nephew got his photo taken next to a tank, the highlight of his day. I thought the museum should have a field of wildflowers at the exit that people could lay in, and tons of puppies that would lick your face to help you detox after the experience. You drove me to the airport when my Fulbright ended. Your latest message to me assured me that you are still well. 
although you are now serving in the army on the outskirts of Kiev. And <laughs> you told me that, quote, I meditate for Putin to be stopped. Me too. Before the pandemic, I traveled a lot, and I enjoyed sending postcards to the people I love. I like sending photos of cowboys to my favorite old ladies in the Ukrainian village of Kriechkivka. I knew the mail would have to go through their local postal service to get to them, and a postcard of a near-naked Cupid would cause a bit of a stir and a chuckle. And then there's Vera. Vera lives in Nibiu and often sends me postcards in return. I hope this reaches you on Valentine's Day. I bought it when I visited the Vatican. This one reminds me of our theater group. Don't you think so too? If you look at this postcard long enough, you can smell flowers in the winter. I received this one on March 2nd, one week after bombs began falling on Ukrainian cities. I wrote to Vera and said that I received her postcard in which she speaks of visiting an art gallery to complete an assignment for her theater class. Her response was, In the Christmas caroling tradition in Ukraine, carolers will visit every home in the village, occupied or unoccupied, and sing carols. The songs describe the homestead, a new gate, columns made of gold, a roof made of silver. Even if the house is dilapidated, we sing the bounty into being. Even though there is a war going on, I sing every day for Ukraine. I sing for children's laughter to fill the orchards of their grandparents. I sing for wide fields of ripe sunflowers. I sing for flowing fields of wheat and rye. I sing for healed wounds and restored families. I sing for forgiveness and reconciliation. I sing for thriving forests, fields of wildflowers, bustling hives of honeybees. I sing for the opportunity to sing with my beloved song keepers in Ukraine again and again and again. I sing to be able to dance with the vibrancy of village women swept up by the spirit. I sing for cows and turkeys and chickens who are so free range they have the right of way on any road. I sing for sharing meals at a long table with side dishes of laughter, songs, jokes, and stories that continue on until the wee hours of the morning. I sing for peace, sovereignty, love, and compassion. I sing for healthy vineyards, growing gardens, and abundance. I sing for the people I love who I have met, for those who I have yet to meet in this country of generosity, of song, of camaraderie, and love. So much love, and more love, and more and more love, and more and more love, and more and more love. And more and more love. People often ask us, what can we do? Who can we help? Um, those are some, and Larissa can probably talk to you more about these, uh, but I, and which I will let her do so she can explain all of these. Um, I often send people to World Central Kitchen because they're still there feeding people not only in Ukraine but in the refugee camps. And aside that, aside from donating your money, you know, take a Ukrainian song that you've learned. when. Um, when the Crimean Peninsula was first taken over, 
people called me in the various places that I had taught workshops and said, we're so devastated by this. We're not Ukrainian, but we're angry and we're sad and we're torn apart by this. And you know what we did? We went to the park and sang every Ukrainian song we know. And people gathered around and said, what are you doing? And we said, we're singing Ukrainian songs because Putin's a jerk and we're protesting. And I was like, great, do that. And then we sang Georgian songs because Putin's a jerk in Georgia too. And then we sang other songs because he's a jerk in more than one country than Ukraine, unfortunately. But in Ukraine, there's a full-scale war going on right now. So really, follow your heart, sing, and let people know that you did this. Because the more people know that the stuff is still going on in Ukraine, that you know about it, and someone they know, you, tells them that you know about it, then they know too. And the more of us that know, and the more of us that can do things, the better it is. So, it is, uh, turn it over to you. Uh, before we do our official end, I'll just tell you quickly, um, as you know, I've been living in Ukraine for a long time, and for the past half year has been uh, very much, it sort of organically happened that I should be involved with kind of coordinating between people abroad who want to help Ukrainians and Ukrainian organizations that are doing great things on the ground. Uh, so I'm a fan of small-scale grassroots organizations, which there are so many of, and these are three organizations that I have worked with personally and can vouch for. Um, Community Self-Help is based in Lviv. Primarily, are, they are providing medical aid both to hospitals throughout Ukraine that don't have enough supplies to do their work and also to units on the front lines. Uh, Heroes Ukraine is based in the southern city of Mykolaiv, very close to the front line. I've spent some time there and one of the, they are doing humanitarian aid for the local population and they're also helping Ukraine's military build new drones that they are using to fight smarter and win the war more quickly. And Ukrainian Patriot is an organization started by a woman like me, who's a friend of mine from the Ukrainian diaspora, who's been living in Ukraine for a long time. And she basically has networks also close to the front. She provides both protective gear for not only soldiers, but also people like medics, people who are evacuating people from the front. And basically, you know, whatever her people and her networks need, she finds ways to get that to them. So if you're interested in sending money, these are my recommendations. Um, I'm also happy just to like in a casual way to chat with anybody or give you my email address or Facebook or something to keep in touch. And I would like to invite <laughs> Nadia and Katya, come, come. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank <laughs> you.